with the planet that we live on. Thank you. Shiva Mohan holds her medical degree, the MD, with a specialization in psychiatry. And that's so perfect for Ayurveda. And what we've discovered this morning, if you didn't know it already, your sense of well-being has a lot to do with the thoughts that you carry. We look forward to your presentation, Shiva. There's some really brilliant minds in this room. And I'm hoping to appeal to the other parts of you. So my Pitta predominance, let's outline everything. <laughs> Go through a quick introduction. Is this better? Okay. So we'll go through a quick introduction. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page of what we're talking about with Ayurveda and just share with you what I fell in love with. And then the whole purpose of this talk really is to convince you that the psycho-spiritual aspects of Ayurveda are absolutely foundational, paramount, important, necessary for the cultural ethic like integrity for the efficacy and for really having a solid self-care practice. That's it. That's my main point. So a little bit about where I came from to talk about this. As Chris mentioned, I have an MD and went into psychiatry not too far away at UCLA. And I wasn't really healing anybody. And I was sort of frustrated with the ability to have impact. And also, nobody comes to psychiatrists anymore unless they want drugs because everyone goes to the psychologists and the therapist and the marriage family therapists and et cetera. So impact, impact. How are we going to really see this whole thing? And I started seeing how in psychiatry, we weren't taking into account everything that's going on in people's lives that are just very clearly affecting them, right? It was kind of all this very limited internal model. So I said, okay, let me go into public health because then we're looking at the whole ecology, right? We're looking at the community, we're looking at the cultures, we're looking at what is, what is creating the decision-making that we have, what is creating the patterns that we hold, right? So I went and worked for the UN and wrote a bunch of reports that probably no one read. And then I had my quarter-life crisis, and what do you do? A lot of yoga, right? <laughs> and uh, came into Ayurveda, and I finally found the system, the framework from which to understand so much of what I was seeing every day in a clinical setting, every day in my own life and family that I didn't have the words for. I didn't have the system to digest and understand and speak about it from on the West. And you can learn more about me and my background on the website. Simple. You're more, it's just so simple, right? So I just want to take a quick moment to define psycho-spiritual. It's everything beyond the physical. Whatever you want to call that, your deep place of knowing, your spirit, your soul, everything beyond the physical, yeah? So why am I talking about this? Like, don't we all get that the psycho-spiritual is really important? Well, apparently not. And, <laughs> you know, for those of you who got to see the documentary yesterday with Gita Desai, she's talking a lot about this, like, the effects of colonialization, the effects of patriarchy, and I don't mean men taking over, but when we talk about patriarchy, I'm talking about when the spiritual 
the inner connection, the feeling, that more feminine yin sort of energy was taken out of the healing picture, was taken out of daily ritual and community. And that happened globally, right? And it wasn't just men that did that. So just to clarify. And also Western mass marketing. What ended up happening? Well, we have... I don't know, hundreds of websites where you can go and survey yourself. I'm a Vada. <laughs> no, you're everything. You're everything. And not only are you everything, and yes, there are predominant patterns in how you were put together, but you're constantly changing. So, you know, this sort of type yourself, and then let's pop out through an algorithm a bunch of rules on how to live eat these foods, wake up at this time, do this two-hour self-care and abhyanga and neti pot practice every morning, and there you go. There's your perfect life. Well, how many of us have that practice? Is it sustainable? I'll tell you, I think it's only sustainable when it's driven by feeling good and not by a should. Right? So that means that feeling good must be the driver, not the bunch of rules that you were told. You need to eat vegetarian, you need to take trifala, whatever it is, right? But because it feels good, and you're connected to what the effect of that practice is, and you're connected to what the heck feels good to you in this moment, right? And if you're not, start there, Ayurveda would say, right? So. Also, all over the place, saying, oh, Ayurveda is the physical science that details herbs and this kind of thing. I don't feel that at all. Um, and hopefully you won't at the end of this next 15 minutes. Ayurveda is a sister science to yoga. Um, this is pretty much printed everywhere. And this might be a bit revolutionary for me to say, but to me, it's the mother science. To yoga. So whereas with yoga we have such amazing tools and ways to shift energetics in our energetic body, knowing what to shift, what tool to use, what to shift, which tool feels best today, how much of that tool, um, which mantra, which pranayam, which asana, what um, music, all of it, what color, everything that has to do with my yoga practice. Um, it, you know, that's all blurred, but the guidance of what you need with all of these amazing tools that yoga provides, that to me is Ayurveda. Uh, this hyper-focus on herbs and diet, I heard one of the documentary doctors say, it's all basically about food, right? Like, it's, you're, you're making up your body out of what you eat, so actually diet is the only thing you need to be healthy. Well, let me tell you, I've seen hundreds of people with a pretty phenomenal diet that don't feel healthy, and they've got toxic relationships, and they've got a lot of stress, and they're commuting all the time. You know, these things matter. It's not just diet. And this allopathicized version of Ayurveda, has anyone been to a Vaidya in India these days? It's like, tongue, you know, like, just like the HMO practices here, almost, <laughs> you know? You, you don't even get to know me. You don't even know what, what I'm feeling. So this allopathicized version, you know, it, it comes from some of those results of the factors that we're talking about here. And then also this fitting into a Western model. So, you know, I have a degree in um, public health, which includes epidemiology. And one thing I learned in epidemiology is there are a lot of ways to change a p-value. A lot. And the other thing I learned after reading all these medical journals for many years is oftentimes the results of studies are reversed. Oh. Now JAMA publishes this big thing saying like fiber is no longer protective for colon cancer, so we shouldn't be prescribing fiber to everybody that is with digestive issues, right? Well, wait a minute. Isn't it kind of common sense that if you keep things flowing in the tube, there's going to be less problems? But it wasn't statistically significant. Do you see? So how do I find a randomized clinical trial where I'm randomizing, but I'm not taking into account the energetic makeup or constitution of people. Isn't it already confounded? 
How can I fit Ayurveda into this Western scientific model? And why am I trying to do that? These are questions I ask. So this is my one slide, five second introduction to Ayurveda. Just in case some of us in here may have entered through the type yourself, live this way model. So we've got our body tissues and we've got our emotions and there's a revealing that's happening to you in every moment and every day, right? What does your tongue feel like? What's the taste in your mouth? What do your eyes feel like? How do your sinuses feel? How does your skin feel? Where are your joints at? What are the qualities in your heart? What are the symptoms in your digestion? Where is your monthly cycle? How are you feeling emotionally? Right now, your body is telling you all of this. But do we have the language in which to understand what it's communicating to us? This is what Ayurveda gives, that reveal, right? So then you know, okay, now I, I understand these are the qualities that are happening in my body, in my emotions. Where does it come from? Well, it's coming from the qualities of your life experience, right? Okay, great. Now the next question is, does that feel good? Do I want this? Yeah, great. Keep making decisions in the same way you're doing wonderfully. The whole purpose of life is to feel good. And I don't mean like I had a caramel macchiato at Starbucks, I feel good. You know, like I mean like deeply good, like all my relationships are thriving and I feel so well supported and I'm on my path and I get to have magical moments like this where everything comes together just exactly as I would want it to, and my body tissues are in harmony, right? Now, if not, then we want to shift the qualities by choosing differently. Now, again, like I was emphasizing, that is a changing thing because what I need, you know, in the summer versus the winter, in the morning versus the evening, in times of transition versus times of ease, in premenstrual versus menopausal times is shifting. Who's going to tell me that? Who's going to tell me all the qualities of my life? So this is the essence of Ayurveda for me in one slide. And I think where it really helps and where we try to elucidate in the class that Felicia and I teach is, is being able to interpret what qualities are there that your body and emotions are communicating to you, and then also some tools and strategies on how to actively shift those qualities. So as Chris mentioned, I'm a psychiatrist, and here is why I think we really need Ayurveda. So with the schools of thought in psychiatry, you know, we have the psychodynamic, this is that classical Freudian lay on the couch and talk about your childhood and blame your parents thing, right? So this is important. It's nice. It's fun. A little exercises, but it's unnecessary also, I think, to just discover where did some of these patterns come from and how I operate and how I make decisions um, in how I react to the world around me and interact with the world around me. In other words, how I receive and respond to life. Great, but limited, right? Okay, say I know why, then what? Well, then enter cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Are there therapists in the room here? Great. Um, so then we look at, okay, let's study, you know, happiness and the traits and the practice of happiness. And happy people listen to guided visualization. Happy people read books. Happy people have friends. Happy people wake up with the sunrise. Happy people eat healthy food. Happy people do all these things, but none of those things will necessarily make you happy. So it's really interesting because I also find cognitive behavioral to be kind of limited. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with this E plus R equals O, but this is like the whole basis of life coaching, right? So this is the event plus the response equals the outcome. And we can't control the events in life. You know, the life is happening, the waves are coming, but we learn to control our responses and thereby shift the outcome. This is a core essence of cognitive behavioral, right? So, you know, if you take the deep breaths instead of yelling, or if you... Um, 
you know, decide to meditate when you're feeling tired instead of having a cup of coffee, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's gazillions of ways that we can modify the R to shift to the O. But again, it's limited because it doesn't have the greater context. Well, what, what O do I want right now? Which O will serve me best? That is not defined by cognitive behavioral necessarily. Um, and it starts to be kind of like limited to just shifting minute responses in life. Now with Ayurveda, we've got, well, what is my nature and how does that affect my decision making? And what are my deeper emotional needs? And what are my feelings actually communicating to me? And how do I show up for them? And am I interconnected? And how do I resolve my internal conflicts? And am I on my path? Like, not the existential questions necessarily, but these questions. This is what makes it, you know, with you in the driver's seat, and this is what makes it individualized, and this is what makes it fluid, where you get to adapt, and you know how to shift your R because you know exactly what O you need in this moment. That's what Ayurveda brings to the table. Now, if I talk about building awareness and then applying that awareness, to create a shift that's going to optimize my O in this lifetime, in this moment, well, the Vedas define that as spiritual growth. So how can I take spirituality and spiritual growth out of this? Because of course I'm going to build awareness and apply it and build awareness and apply it. And all towards what? Towards feeling good. We heard this a lot. Nothing in you operates, and nothing in the natural universe operates in isolation. So, you know, I've convinced you maybe mentally that Ayurveda and the psycho-spiritual aspects are so important, but even personally, Ayurveda is how I came to feel my vibrational state, how I came to feel my wholeness, my context, my divinity, my humanity, my all of it, and to accept and love all of it. So now you also have a feeling of what it could feel like and why the psycho-spiritual is important. So who benefits from that? Everybody that's around me, right? Um, so, you know, in answer to Dr. Kumar's question, like, you know, where do we start? I would say the answer is that we start within ourselves with these kind of awareness building practices, right? So look, let's, go, let's get into cultural integrity. You know, I just, I think about, I geek out about all the time, ancient matriarchal societies, it's a side hobby of mine. And I think about these women in the ancient Indus Valley and how they were bleeding on the earth to give offering and to inform the crops of where they were at so that their own crops could fine tune and best meet their nutritional needs. How they would, you know, place their blood on their bindu here to inform their pineal gland and strengthen their reproductive tissues and systems and their manifestational potency, AKA Shakti. Yeah, when I told my mom about that, she was horrified. <laughs> what do you mean? It wasn't always just some dye powder? No. You know, so it, it, think about this. Like, this is where these practices came from. It's, it's so connected, it's so reverent right? Like dehydrating Ayurveda w with taking the psycho-spiritual out is, is like just having that dyed powder. It's not having the same effect. It's not going to activate your pineal gland, right? So I just want to pose a question, you know, when is it that we say the cultural integrity is proof enough that thousands of years of observational study are more believable than an RCT. You know, when we have thousands of years of a relationship with, with turmeric, 
as a whole plant, and we understand that its immune system is so sophisticated, almost more so than ours, then why are we measuring the effects of curcumin extract in rats and spending millions of dollars to do so? Who are we proving this to? You know, NIH, I can't even, I wanted to get the statistic, but how many hundreds of millions of dollars we've spent studying the effects of stress on the human body? We know stress does bad things for the human body. Are we really going to create a pill to protect the human body from stress, or are we going to change how we're living to decrease the stress? Where are we investing our time and our energy and our belief systems? So, look, your life affects your health. You've gotten that already from everywhere. So, you know, you can take all the herbs and you can eat the kitchery. And, you know, if you're not looking at your dharma, if you're not looking at your internal conflicts, if you're not looking at your relationships, if you're not connected to nature, then, it, you know, it's like just slowly pushing this tiny uphill battle. <laughs> It all synergizes. This is a holistic system. So when you bring in those aspects and you bring in the psycho-spiritual, then you see true results, synergizes. So I'll wrap up here. I realized I've been going a little too long. Felicia already talked about the self-care aspects of it. You guys get it. You know, If you want to be able to do this and you want to be able to do it well, you have to step into the driver's seat of your own health. And Ayurveda, what I'll leave you with as my concluding remark, is the only natural healing system I know where you step into that place and you take back the power from the practitioner and you get to answer that question, where am I at, what do I need? Where am I at, what do I need? Where am I at, what do I need? And I'm in charge of giving that to myself and I'm in charge of my happiness and I'm in charge of my health and I show up for myself. So I hope you guys will get a little bit excited about Ayurveda and the potential that it has for your own empowerment.